Hello there. I'm Charles Coburn. And I want to tell you a story called The Comedy of Errors. I think it's a very funny story. And I believe you'll think so too. It was made into a play by William Shakespeare more than 300 years ago. The Comedy of Errors is really the story of two gentlemen who were twin brothers and their servants who also were twin brothers. The gentlemen brothers were so much alike when they were born that their parents thought their name should be alike too. So they named them both Antipolis. <laughs> That's a funny name, Antiphilus. But that's what the parents, Aegean and Amelia, call their twin sons. And here's another funny thing. The twin servants, who were born on the same day as their twin masters, were so much like each other that their parents did the same thing. They named them both Dromeo. Well, I don't need to tell you that there were plenty of mix-ups when the two Antiphiluses and their servants, the two Dromeos, grew up. Each looking so much like his brother, that the two Antipholuses couldn't even tell the two Dromeos apart, and neither could the Dromeos tell the Antipholuses apart. Now, one of the Antipholuses and one of the Dromeos got separated from the other Antipholus and the other Dromeo in a shipwreck when they were still small babies. One Antipholus and one Dromeo were rescued with the Antipholus's father, Aegean, and taken to a town named Syracuse. And the other Antipholus and the other Dromeo were rescued with the Antipholus's mother, Amelia, and taken to a faraway town named Ephesus. After that, the first Antipholus was called Antipholus of Syracuse, and his servant was called Dromeo of Syracuse, and the other Antipholus was called Antipholus of Ephesus, and his servant was called Dromeo of Ephesus. And now, if you're as mixed up as I am, we'll begin their story. Aegean, the Antipholus's father, was a merchant in Syracuse. For years and years, he had been traveling around trying to find his wife, Amelia, and the other Antipholus. But it was no use. He couldn't find them. Until at last, Aegean got so worried about his wife and his missing son that he did a very foolish thing. He went from his home in Syracuse to Ephesus, hoping he might run into them there. The reason it was a foolish thing was that the people of Ephesus didn't like the people of Syracuse, and they had made some pretty cruel laws against them. Well, you can imagine what happened. Aegean was caught in Ephesus, and the Duke of Ephesus sentenced Aegean to die, because Aegean was broke and couldn't pay a fine of a thousand marks to save his own life. You may think the Duke was an old meanie, but he wasn't really. Because when he heard the story of Aegean's long search for his missing wife and son, the Duke said, Hapless Aegean, now trust me. If it were not against our laws, against my crown, my oath, my dignity, my soul should sue as advocate for thee. Of course, what he meant was, he'd like to set Aegean free, but he couldn't. But he did give Aegean all day to try to find someone in Ephesus who would lend him the money to pay his fine. So without much hope of being successful, the old man set out to look. And there we have to leave him until late in the day. Now on this same day, Aegean's son Antiphilus of Syracuse and his servant Dromio of Syracuse also came to Ephesus, also trying to find Antiphilus's brother and mother, and incidentally, Dromio's brother too. They had left Syracuse some years before Aegean, so they had not seen him for several years. But they were wiser than Aegean. They didn't tell anyone they were from Syracuse. They pretended to be from another town, a town which the people of Ephesus thought was a very nice town, next to Ephesus, that is, because, of course, everybody thinks his own town is the best town in the world. And now, if you'll change the record, I'll tell you about the mix-ups that happened as Antiphilus and Dromeo of Syracuse went around the town of Ephesus looking for their lost twin brother. You must remember that the twin brother of Antiphilus of Syracuse and the twin of his servant, Dromeo of Syracuse, had been brought to Ephesus years before when they had been rescued from that shipwreck. And they were now called Antiphilus of Ephesus and Dromeo of Ephesus. But of course, Antiphilus of Syracuse didn't know that. He was feeling pretty hopeless as he started to search for his lost brother and his mother, Amelia. He gave all his money to his servant, Romeo of Syracuse, 
and told him to take it to the inn where they were staying and to wait for him there. You see, he didn't want to carry the money around himself because it was all gold and very heavy. They didn't have paper money in those days. But wait, I'll let you hear what Antipolis of Syracuse sounded like when he talked to Dromeo. Go, take this money to our inn and stay there, Dromeo, till I come to thee. Go. <laughs> Many a man would take you at your word and run away with so much money as this. <laughs> Antipolis wasn't worried about his money, though. He'd have trusted Dromeo of Syracuse with anything. But very soon he began to have doubts of Dromeo's honesty. For he had walked only a short distance when he saw his servant returning to him. At least, that's what he thought. But actually, it was his brother's servant, Dromeo of Ephesus. Listen. What now, Dromeo? How chance thou art returned so soon? Return so soon? Rather approach too late. Your wife, my mistress, sent me to bid you hurry to your dinner. She is hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. Stop this nonsense. My wife, your mistress, dinner. You know I have no wife. Where have you left the gold that I gave to you? To me, sir? Why, you gave no gold to me. <laughs> of course, Dromeo of Ephesus thought he was talking to his own master. And Antipholus of Syracuse thought he was talking to his own servant. <laughs> so they had a hot argument that ended by Antipholus starting to beat the tar out of Dromeo of Ephesus. And Dromeo ran for his life, ran home to tell his mistress that her husband, as he thought, had gone crazy. Her name was Adriana, and she was a very hot-tempered lady. She had a lovely sister named Luciana, who tried to pacify her, but not a chance. Adriana sent Dromeo right back to find his master and insist that he come home to dinner. While this was going on, Antipholus of Syracuse rushed to his inn only to discover that his money was quite safe and that his Dromeo had gone out to find him after leaving the gold with the hotel keeper. This puzzled Antiphilus because he couldn't understand how his servant had got about so fast, since he was sure he just left him in the street. Well, at that moment, Dromeo of Syracuse came back to the inn. Naturally, he denied that he had said his master had not given him the gold or that he had said anything about Antiphilus' wife because, of course, he knew Antiphilus of Syracuse didn't have a wife. Well, that resulted in Antiphilus beating him, just as he had previously beaten his brother in the street. But the beating was interrupted by the appearance of Luciana and her sister, Adriana, who had come looking for her husband, Antiphilus of Ephesus, because she thought Dromeo of Ephesus was taking too long to find him. And, of course, she thought that she had found him when she saw Antiphilus of Syracuse with his Dromeo, and so she ordered him to come home with her to dinner. Come, Antipolis, no longer will I be a fool. Come, husband, to dinner at once. Plead you to me, fair dame? I know you not. In very truth, you are no wife of mine. Whatever is the man saying, Luciana? Fie, brother, when will you want to use my sister thus? She sent for you by Dromeo home to dinner. By Dromeo? By me? Did you converse with this gentlewoman? I, sir, I never saw her till this time. How can she thus then call us by our names? <laughs> well, Dromeo of Syracuse couldn't answer that one. But Adriana gave him no chance to talk anyway. She simply insisted that Antiphilus and Dromeo come home with her and her sister Luciana. Antiphilus didn't like Adriana very well. She was too high-handed and hot-tempered to suit him. But her lovely sister was something else again. He liked her very much. And besides... It had been a long time since breakfast, so he allowed himself to be taken home by the two women. And when they got there, Dromeo of Syracuse was left inside the gate as watchman, where his brother should have been. But of course, Adriana and Luciana were certain that he was his brother. I'll tell you on the next record what happened then. While all that was going on, the other Dromeo finally found his master. He was talking to a goldsmith, ordering a golden chain for Adriana. But when Dromeo told him of her anger, he invited the goldsmith home to dinner, hoping that that would make his wife forget her reign. He was very much puzzled, though, by Dromeo's claiming he had come for him before. He said, Thou sayest thou met me in the street, and that I beat thee? Mary, sir, that you did. And that I claimed I'd given you a sum of gold, and even denied I had a wife and house? That too, sir. How drunk art thou! What dost thou mean by this? Take that! Ow, and that! Ow, and that! <laughs> well, 
Uh, just then, they got to Antipholus's house, where Antipholus of Syracuse was dining with Adriana and Luciana. There, Dromio of Syracuse, who had been left inside the gate as watchman, refused to let Antipholus of Ephesus into his own house. This made him so mad that he took his guest to the home of a girl he had known before he married Adriana. And he sent the goldsmith to get the golden chain, intending to give it to this girl. Meanwhile, in the house after dinner, when Adriana was busy in the kitchen, I suppose, Antipholus of Syracuse tried to make love to Luciana. Just listen to them. Sweet mistress, what your name is else, I know not. Thee will I love, and with thee lead my life. Thou hast no husband yet, nor I no wife. What? Are you mad that you do reason so? You should be saying such things to my sister, not to me. Ah, sweet love. Why call you me love? Call my sister so. Thy sister, sister. That's my sister. No, it is thyself, my dear heart, dearer heart. <laughs> well, you can see he was pretty far gone. But Luciana jumped up and rushed out to call her sister. And just then, Dromeo rushed in to tell Antipholus that the cook kept insisting that she was Dromeo's wife. Dromeo said he wouldn't stay in the house another instant. So Antipholus sent Dromeo to see if any ship was leaving port that night on which they could escape from this crazy place. He told Dromeo to meet him in front of the inn. And off went Dromeo like a grease lightning. And as Antipholus was about to leave the house, he was stopped at the gate by the goldsmith who insisted that Antipholus had ordered the golden chain, which actually his brother had ordered. But the goldsmith forced it on Antipholus of Syracuse and went away without even waiting to be paid for it. Soon after the goldsmith left Antipholus, he ran into a merchant to whom he owed some money. The goldsmith was telling the merchant about the money Antipholus of Ephesus owed him for the chain, when that gentleman himself and his servant, Dromeo of Ephesus, came round the corner. Antipholus was just sending Dromeo to buy a rope whip with which to punish his wife for locking him out when the goldsmith caught sight of him. Fine, thought the goldsmith. Now I can collect for the chain and pay my own debt. But of course Antipholus of Ephesus denied he had received the chain. Well, this started a real argument. The merchant had the goldsmith arrested and the goldsmith had Antipholus of Ephesus arrested. At this point, Dromeo of Syracuse turned up. Thinking he was talking to his master, he told Antiphilus that his baggage was on a ship that was all ready to sail. Antiphilus said, You madman, I sent you for a whip, not a ship. Oh, but never mind. Go now to Adriana and get money from her to bail me out of jail. Well, Dromeo was more perplexed than ever as he made off for the house and the policeman dragged Antipholus of Ephesus and the goldsmith off to jail. Now, angry as she was, Adriana wasn't mad enough to let her husband lie in jail. So Dromeo of Syracuse was soon running toward the jail with the money. But wait. On the way, he met the real master. Master, here's the gold you sent me for. What gold? Is there any ship puts forth tonight? Why, sir, I, I brought you word of a ship an hour ago, just as you were being arrested. Arrested? The fellow is distract, and so am I. <laughs> and then, just to make things more complicated, poor Antipholus was set upon by that young woman to whom his twin brother had promised the golden chain. She claimed she had given him a diamond ring on his promise of the chain. And when he refused to give it to her, she left in a huff, threatening to tell his wife. <laughs> but of course, Antipholus didn't have a wife. <laughs> well, let's play the next record and hear the rest. Now let's see what has happened to Antipholus of Ephesus and the goldsmith, whom we left in the clutches of the law. The goldsmith managed to get money to pay his debt to the merchant, so he has gone free, but not Antipholus. The policeman still has him as they meet his servant, Romeo of Ephesus, carrying the rope whip he was ordered to get. Here comes my man. How now, Romeo? Have you that I sent you for? Here it is, sir. The whip. But the money. Where's the money? Why, sir, I gave the money for the whip. Five hundred ducats, villain, for a whip. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, just then, Adriana arrived with a doctor to examine Antipholus. She was certain that he'd gone crazy. Then her husband asked her why she hadn't given Dromeo the money to bail him out. She said she had, but Dromeo swore she had not. 
At any rate, Adriana agreed to pay her husband's debt, so the policeman turned him over to the doctor along with Dromeo, both objecting wildly. And Adriana left with the policeman to find the goldsmith and claim the chain for which the goldsmith was demanding payment. Before she could find him, though, the goldsmith and the merchant met Antipholus of Syracuse and his Dromeo. The meeting took place in front of an abbey or convent. Well, Antipholus was wearing the goldsmith's chain around his neck. And when the goldsmith asked him why he had previously denied receiving it, Antipholus naturally said he never had denied it. This made the goldsmith and the merchant so angry, they drew their swords. But Adriana and her sister came along just then and rescued Antipholus and Dromeo, while the abbess, that's the head nun, took them into the abbey where they were safe, even from Adriana. By this time, the day was drawing to its end, when Aegean, father of the Antipholuses, was to lose his life unless he could pay his fine. So the Duke of Ephesus and a party of officers came past the abbey, leading poor old Aegean to his execution. Well, Adriana stopped the procession and begged the Duke to force the abbess to release Antipholus and Dromeo. But just then, in rushed Antipholus of Ephesus and his Dromeo. They had succeeded in breaking away from the doctor. Of course, everyone thought they must have escaped from the abbey. But Aegean thought he was seeing Antipholus of Syracuse and his servant, Dromeo of Syracuse. Because, of course, he hadn't seen the other Antipholus since he had been a tiny baby. And the Duke didn't know what to think. Antipholus of Ephesus begged the Duke for justice against Adriana for locking him out of his house. And Adriana insisted she had done no such thing. She said her husband had dined with her that very day. Luciana agreed. Then everybody began explaining to the Duke exactly what had happened. The only trouble was that no two people told exactly the same story. Well, it was too much for the poor old Duke. And when Adriana told him that Antipholus and Dromeo had entered the abbey just a few minutes before, and when Antipholus and Dromeo themselves denied it, why then the Duke said, Call the abbess hither. I think you're all stark raving mad. Well, while the abbess was being called, Aegean tried to talk to Antipholus of Ephesus and his Dromeo, but he was as much at sea as everybody else, because Antipholus and Dromeo naturally didn't recognize Aegean, and they insisted they had never been to Syracuse, though Aegean was just as certain they had left there only seven years before. So the fat was in the fire again. But at that very moment, the Duke's messenger returned, and with him from the abbey, came the abbess and Antipholus of Syracuse and Dromeo of Syracuse. Adriana, when she saw them, nearly fainted. She let out a scream. Oh! I see two husbands. Oh, my eyes deceive me. <laughs> well, of course, Antipholus and Dromeo of Syracuse did recognize Aegean, and so did the abbess, for she was Amelia, Aegean's long-lost wife. She had been separated from Antipholus and Dromeo of Ephesus soon after they were rescued from the sea and had never seen them since until that moment. So at last, everything was explained. The Duke pardoned Aegean, the goldsmith got his money, Adriana got her chain, the girlfriend got her diamond ring, Antipholus of Ephesus got his wife, and Antipholus of Syracuse got Luciana. Well... <laughs> I told you it was going to be a mixed-up story, but that's Mr. Shakespeare's story of the comedy of errors.